Good afternoon, everyone. I understand that the state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearings notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. Will the clerk please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that they are present when their names are called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mark Squilla. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and colleagues. I'm present. David O. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, colleagues. Ready for the hearing. Cindy Bass. Good afternoon to all my colleagues and Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding the hearing. Catherine Gilmore Richardson. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and good afternoon, colleagues. Bobby Heenan. Good afternoon, colleagues and good afternoon, Chairman. And Maria Canones Sanchez. Good afternoon, folks present. Thank you. A quorum of the committee is present and this hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the committee on rules regarding bill numbers 200828, 210075, 210078, and 210081. Will the clerk please read the titles of the bills? And my apologies, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, it is the first bill was 200628, not 828. But um, the first bill is 200628, an ordinance amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning by revising and clarifying certain provisions and making technical changes all under ter certain terms and conditions. Bill number 210075. An ordinance amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning by revising and clarifying certain provisions and making technical changes all under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 210078. An ordinance amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning by revising and clarifying certain portion provisions and making technical changes all under certain terms and conditions. And finally, 210081 an ordinance amending chapter 9-3900 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Property License and Owner Accountability, section A-906 entitled Property License Fees, chapter 14-604 entitled Accessory Units and Structures, and chapter 19-2400 entitled Hotel Room Rental Tax to add and revise provisions related to the use of properties for limited lodging and hotel purposes and to the collection of hotel rental taxes in connection therewith, all under certain terms and conditions. Before we begin to hear a testimony from the witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for the questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available on Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they, that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Will the clerk please call the panel for the bill. <laughs> bill number 200628. Paula Brumblow Burns. Hi, good afternoon members of the Rules Committee. I am Paula Brumblow Burns, city planner with the legislative team of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I'm here to testify on bill number 200628, which was introduced into city council on November 13th, 2020 by council member Squilla. 
Bill number 200628 amends Title 14 of the Philadelphia Zoning Code entitled Zoning and Planning by revising and clarifying certain provisions and making technical changes all under certain terms and conditions. The proposed bill is primarily technical in nature, but does include a small number of amendments that are substantive and address issues with the current text for the Central Delaware Riverfront Overlay District, otherwise known as CDO. The first clarifies that the calculation of gross floor area for projects that undergo the optional review process will have some parking exempted, which is similar to how gross floor area is calculated in Chapter 14-800 of the parking requirements. The second adds a formula for the calculation of the in-lieu fee for projects that earn height bonuses in the CDO and the East Callow Hill Overlay Districts. In addition, there are small technical changes that address issues with previous legislation that pertain to the CDO overlay. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill number 200628 at its meeting of November 17, 2020 and recommended approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions and comments from members of the committee? Councilman Mark Squiller. Nothing from me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Questions and comments from any other members of the committee? Thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the next bill? For 210075, we have Paula Brumblow Burns. Good afternoon again. I am Paula Brumbelow Burns, city planner with the legislative team of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on bill number 210075, which was introduced to city council on February 2nd, 2021 by council member Johnson. Bill number 210075 amends title 14 of the Philadelphia code entitled zoning and planning by revising and clarifying certain provisions and making technical changes all under certain terms and conditions. The proposed bill makes technical changes to the zoning code, along with minor grammar corrections and adds one substantive change. Technical amendments include adding clarity to the code in addressing driveway aisle widths, reductions, along with required parking spaces to be lined for on-site accurate counts. Personal vehicle repair and maintenance is updated by providing specific standards on fencing, paved surfaces and parking cars only within the approved zoning law. Included in the bill is the removal of several area specific provisions that had a specific sunset date, sunset date that has passed. The last change of note is the removal of the fresh food market bonus from the code, which was not meeting the goals of reducing food deserts within communities in need. The planning commission will continue to work with the health department to find other ways to address this important issue. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered bill number 210075 at its meeting of February 25th, 2021 and recommended approval with amendments. I'll be happy to answer questions at this time. Any questions and comments from members of the committee? Hearing Mr. Chairman, you, Mr. Chairman, I, yes. Mr. Chairman, I do have a question. Councilman would, Bass. Uh, thank you. I'm wondering if we could get further clarification on um, the uh, food desert component and the fact that this uh, uh, piece of the uh, equation was not meeting the goal. What, uh, do, do we have a specified goal and can they talk a little bit further about uh, why that particular component uh, is being removed? Yes, I can council member Beth. One of the things when we create, when we did the zoning code in 2012 was to bring in fresh markets into neighborhoods that didn't have access to grocery stores or a lot of fresh food. From what we've seen of the applicants and developers that take advantage of the fresh food market bonus, which allows more height, is that they were going in areas within blocks of uh, larger grocery stores. So we would see one across the street from Acme or we would see one down the street or we would end up with three like on three corners out of four and so it was mostly in the center city and close neighborhoods of center city so northern liberties 
Sasna, Queen Village, we were seeing a lot of the food bonuses go there. And we didn't see them go to the neighborhoods that desperately need fresh food. And so it isn't currently working in the current pattern we have. So we would really like to find ways, not just through the zoning code, but how do we incentivize fresh food markets in the food deserts? Okay, thank you. Um, I just, You're welcome. Do, do, do we have, like, sort of, can you speak specifically by district or, I guess I'm curious in terms of my district as an example. So I'm not in any of those neighborhoods that you listed, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, we have our fair share of, of, uh, of uh, food deserts. And so I'm hesitant to pull out a tool which may not be working as well as we had thought. Maybe there are ways to retool it as is rather than seeing it completely go away. We've already retooled it once by making it have a larger minimum size and it still wasn't quite working. We came up with some other alternates, but it just didn't get enough buy-in through different staff agencies. So also, if I believe in your district, and I did not research this before this call, I believe your district had one food bonus sought for, and it was along Germantown Avenue, but it was not in what the health department would consider a food desert. I may be missing one or two in your district, but that's the one I can reference. Okay. All right. And I'm familiar with the one that you're referring to. Um, okay. A question. Uh, did, did anybody do outreach to encourage uh, food deserts during the licensing process? Let's say if someone's opening up a new establishment, do we? does the city naturally do any sort of outreach to encourage uh, the, the bonus? I believe that the health department tries to get fresh food in and tries to work with different store owners and how to incorporate fresh food into some of the existing smaller corner stores. But that is through the health department. Okay, so we tackle it from that angle. Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, um, and you said that there were efforts underway by planning to sort of reconfigure or look at this again in different ways to try to uh, make sure that it happens in a more robust way? Absolutely. Our goal is to reduce the amount, not only reduce the amount of food deserts, but reduce the size of the food deserts together. And mm -hmm. it's something where we've kind of set aside now that we're already almost at the middle of March. We really want to take a closer look with the health department over the summer. Okay. Is there a, is there a plan as to when uh, something could be unveiled? To the public that we could, uh, you know, look towards embracing to, to make these changes happen? Not yet. Okay. But I if, do know if, that that is a priority of yours, so we will make sure we note that on our um, working list. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And I would appreciate if you could, uh, let's, you know, keep the chairman in the loop. And as these things are unfolding, if we could uh, you know, maybe have an opportunity to weigh in, provide some input, provide our, you know, knowledge of what's happening in our district and uh, what we could suggest to be helpful to you all. We would love to provide some input. And, you know, one of the things that we can do is host a listening session where we listen to what the concerns are and what ideas mm -hmm. are and then kind of build off that so we can actually include you all from the beginning. Very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you very you, much, Paul. Uh, thank, thank you, Councilman Bass. Um, Paula, I, I have a question as, as well regarding as you move forward with your new plan. How, how do you take in consideration um, income guidelines in terms of the zip codes when promoting um, initiatives like this around fresh, um, around around? I'm sorry, fresh foods and food deserts? Because obviously, you know the areas that are significantly impacted that you mentioned, a lot of it is my area where you have four or five supermarkets. But the interesting part is that they are a city, city southwest of the city, high affluent area targeted as opposed to the low income areas 
And so it is defeating the purpose. And so how do you address that um, moving forward? So at the target is areas that really are home food deserts, because I don't think anybody on the call would, would agree that, you know, southwest of the city is like a, you know, technically food desert as well as, you know, Northern Liberties as well. Yeah, it's the difference of once you cross Washington Avenue, you know, I understand yeah. that better. Um, we have not quite gotten that in depth of how we're going to approach it. We really want to kind of take the lead and direction from the health department because they have more experience with food deserts, but we will make sure I've actually written down incorporate zip code. So we will look into that. We don't have a strategy Thank yet. Thank you very much. Please continue members of the committee you know, informed as you move forward through the process. Um, any other questions and comments from members of the committee? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, yes. Chair? yes. Uh, this is... Go ahead, Councilwoman. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I just had a very quick question um, around the green roof uh, density bonus program, if that was appropriate, Paula, for you to take now. I believe that was in here and it wasn't that we're getting rid of it. We're just adjusting the language to make sure it is easier for LNI to incorporate and applicants to understand we are keeping the green roof density bonus relatively the same, just adjusting the language a little bit. Okay, so if you could just follow up uh, with the chair um, so we could receive the information around the changes there and then also how many properties um, are currently taking advantage of the, the green roof uh, density bonus and um, if there are any more properties, um, you know, that are in the pipeline to use the green roof density bonus, if you, you could just um, help us with that information. If you can hold on for one minute. Okay. In the last year, I have to thank Ellen I for getting this information to me, like literally on Monday. 28 properties in the last year applied to use a green roof density bonus. That doesn't mean they were granted, but 28 applied and eight were in RM1 district. Okay. I haven't broken it down any farther past that number. I got the okay. information yesterday morning, so. Excellent. Okay, so any further information you could provide uh, would be very, very helpful. Absolutely. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Mr. Chair? Yeah. Uh, Brian O'Neill, I'm just uh, telling you, I've been on the call for a while now, but I missed the roll call. Okay, thank you. Yes. I want to first your knowledge. Um, Councilman O'Neill is present, as, and also we have joining the committee hearing is Councilwoman Sherelle Parker, Madam Leader. Any other questions or comments for members of the committee? For members of the committee? If not hearing none, would a clerk please call the next bill? For bill number 210078, we have Paula Brumblow Burns. I'm just opening up all my screens because I have a copy of the bill and the testimony and our fact sheet. So everything's all together. So, Council Member Johnson, can I open up real oh. quickly around putting this in a context as she, as Paula gets prepared? <laughs> Thank you. Ab ab absolutely. To, to chair recognize the council, uh, Councilwoman Maria Keona Sanchez. Thank you. Like Council Member Heenan, I'm having a technology connection problem, so I have to remain off screen so that I can um, not get the shoddy um, uh, uh, feed. But thank you so very much, uh, Chairman Johnson and members of the committee. Bill number 210078 is the result of very detailed and collaborative uh, work by the Zoning Technical Committee and the COVID-19 Development Work Group, which many members of council have participated from time to time as we tr tried to restart the construction industry. Um, in, in the city of Philadelphia. We've been meeting since the pandemic to meet to support safe and healthy restart of community-driven equitable development activities by recommending code amendments, updating some of the permitting process and further study some of the certain laws and regu regulations. I would really want to thank the Zoning Technical Committee, the Development Working Group, which many members were part of, Council Member Dom and others. Obviously, the city 
council leadership team who helped, you know, push and drive this, the entire planning commissioning and the development services division of license and inspections, as well as the, the law department. Um, everyone shepherd during the um, reopening process, and I really want to thank them. So this bill is a result of the traditional work that planning commission does as it prepares um, to update its its. Um, uh, some of its uh, uh, regulations, but also some of the things we learned during COVID around how do we help businesses um, and, and clarify some of the, our working things. So what does the bill clarify, simplify, or amend um, is very important about uses and some of the dimensional uh, standards you'll hear from the Planning Commission of Paula will explain in detail and her team um, some of the uh, issues related to artist studio industrial uh, to permit some food, beverage, and apparel stuff. This really is related to people pivoting and responding to COVID. How do they kind of multitask some of this stuff? It clarifies the CDR role um, as it relates to industrial uses. It removes some of the retail um, restrictions around our, our RMX. Um, it reduces the RSA five minimum lot size standard to conform to some of the more realistic actual um, dimensions. Uh, this one, it establishes a new zoning district, RSA six, to accommodate um, more homes around some of these narrow streets. And this is an important provision and you'll hear from the planning commission because this is a tool, a new tool that council district members will have to opt into. Um, so it's not something that will be used unless council members through their planning and zone based, um, uh, remapping, uh, utilize it. It establishes the new stoning district as it relates to educational and civic uses, um, and it requires CMX 2.5 to build to the lot lines so that some of these um, primary frontage um, do are aligned with commercial districts and some of the work we're doing. It simplifies some of the density requirements around RMM1 and CMX2 zoning district. It simplifies some of the split, lot z split zone lots. Um, and we're really working with the planning commission and the uh, BIA to, you know, create a chart. So this is really not left to discretion, but it really is more predictable as folks are um, assembling parcels for redevelopment and it updates some of the parking requirements around some of the research development facilities as well. Again, what are some of the amenities related to eating, drinking, personal services around some of these industrial. Um, the amendments that we will come forward in the Planning Commission will also explain and be available for all questions, um, clarify and simplify some of the uh, issues related to el eliminate special exemptions around some tree re replacement standards standards and I one zoning districts um, and it also will limit um, and exclude some of the religious institutions we heard from some of the clergy and we responded um, as it relates to the RS a six zoning district, and I know I talked to some of the district council members who are concerned around this. It really does help for preservation purposes. Um, the existing two-story block provision that that currently exists, and again, the planning commission will will de detail this at the request of council members. You know, we've really tried to respond to all district council members. Ninth, the ninth and the tenth district um, changes related to the RSA five minimum lot, lot size. Um, are included in here to respect with um, some of their own district planning uh, provisions that they have. And it limits some of the split zoning refusals, particularly in large districts uh, with minimum lot size. And again, this is an area where the Planning Commission and the LNI will work on a regulatory, a regulatory table that really allows for people to see real clear clut clear cut um, what they are proposing to do. Um, again, I want to thank all of the council members who participated in this process. Obviously, Council Member O'Neill, who's an expert at this, Councilwoman Parker and others. We have, um, I believe, addressed working with the Building Industry Association. We've addressed most of the areas of concern. Oh, we, you know, this is a good bill. Um, we're not letting the good be the enemy of the perfect and at the same time honoring 
district council members uh, individual planning processes as we move, move forward. So council member Johnson, uh, Mr. Chair, I wanna thank you and your and your team for working with us and the planning commission through uh, these provisions. What we thought was gonna be something simple was more complicated, but I, I can assure you that both the planning staff and um, from the private industry, we've uh, attempted to accommodate everyone so that we can move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And, and Paula, before I move on um, to this bill, I want to I want to go back regarding the amendments. I have two amendments for Bill 210075. I just want to um, briefly just go over um, prior to me bringing up the next bill. And, and I'm, I'm going to be brief as quick as I can. Okay. Um, and the first one is regarding uh, for Bill 210075. It's in the repeal of the West Oregon Avenue Overlay District. Um, that overlay was passed to support a mixed-use renovation to the existing shopping center um, in South Philadelphia with, mm -hmm. additional, with additional housing. Um, the project is no longer moving forward, so the EOP and the Community Benefits Agreement that we worked on um, right now moving forward is no longer um, in effect. So that's going to be the first amendment um, that we'll, we'll be sending over to planning. And then the second amendment will make a small change to the Mixed Income Housing Bonus Program um, that's the one that was established by my colleague, um, Maria Kiona Sanchez. Um, in South Philadelphia, we're experiencing a particularly acute housing affordability crisis. And so this particular um, amendment uh, will provide an opportunity for developers to um, build, if we require them to do an on-site um, affordable unit, um, if they're taking advantage of the um, housing um, density um, bonus. And so as opposed to putting the money in the trust fund, um, they will be required to actually build um, a unit on that particular site. And so um, I'll continue to look at uh, how we can address this issue around um, demolition and gentrification in certain parts of my district. But we wanted to begin looking at how we can make more affordable units available for individuals who are taking advantage of the housing bonus and so this is one of the amendments that we came up with and just wanted to go on a record um, that it's being submitted as a part of Bill 210075. Thank you. Would a clerk please call the next bill? Council member, uh, Councilwoman Parker Mr. wanted to speak on. Councilman. Yeah, can... No, Councilwoman Parker, Chairman uh, Johnson, I put it in the chat. Yes, Councilwoman Parker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, uh, Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm here to make comments on bill number 210078, um, the COVID zoning uh, relief bill. Um, and want to just uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity, um, along with Council uh, Member Canona Sanchez, who I had an opportunity uh, to speak with regarding this matter and, and just needed to lay out publicly for um, the record and explanation um, for the three um, amendments um, that um, I have some uh, concerns with. Uh, three issues. Number one, I requested that the ninth district be exempted from the three proposed zoning code changes in bill number 210078. They are a reduction in the minimum lot size requirements in the RSA-5 zoning district uh, from 1,440 square feet to 960 square feet. Next is the increase in the number of permitted units in the RM1 zoning based district based on a revised formula and allowance of number three, allowance of accessory dwelling units in the RSA5 and the CMX1 zoning district. Um, Mr. Chairman, while these provisions are intended to reduce the number of zoning appeals, as well as increase the availability of affordable housing, um, I would argue that a one size fits all approach to address these complex issues in a city as racially, economically, and geographically diverse as Philadelphia, in my opinion, would be a serious mistake. 
In the ninth district in particular, these proposed changes could further some of the negative patterns that we've witnessed over the past several years. And Mr. Chairman, I don't have to tell you and my colleagues, you know that's happened in a very public way. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I've never been afraid to make a very difficult land use decision. Um, you know, most times I, you know, I love it when I can be in agreement with the community in, at large and the RCO, but sometimes that has not happened. Happen. And when I've needed to make those decisions, um, I have, Mr. Chairman. And with that uh, being said, uh, my record is clear that I am not anti-development at all, uh, but rather I openly welcome investment in the ninth district neighborhoods that will enhance the quality of life for the residents who live there and make our communities attractive places for new residents. Unfortunately, I believe the proposed changes could have the opposite effect in neighborhoods and districts like the ninth. Number one, Mr. Chairman, reduction in minimum lot size for the RSA-5 zoning district. RSA-5, it's, it's the densest single family residential zoning district, and it is intended for attached properties. Um, for the public, I'm talking about row houses, okay? The ninth council district is primarily residential with a limited amount of vacant land available for development. I have repeatedly um, seen uh, developers attempt to squeeze as many units as possible onto vacant or blighted parcels without giving serious consideration of the impact on the character and or quality of life in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, I'm gravely concerned that a reduction in the minimum lot size requirement, it will further encourage this trend, leading to overcrowding um, and quite frankly, a decline in the quality of life in our communities. I want to give you all a real life example that played out in public for me. On Rodney Street um, in, in the 9th District, um, it was zone RS, um, RS, RSA 3. Single family home um, was on a lot, large lot. It was purchased at a mortgage foreclosure share sale um, by a developer. The beautiful house that was there, it was torn down and then the lot was subdivided to build two twin, two twins, um, four units in essence. And this was done by right. Houses originally um, proposed when 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 they were proposed to the to the community and the public, they were all vinyl siding in contrast to the primary brick and stone composition of the area houses, including the one that was torn down. The Ninth Council District has a total of 37,147 properties that are zoned RSA-5. Approximately 10.1% of these properties would be eligible for subdivision based on lot size alone if the proposed changes were enacted for um, my district. Now, um, I, I want to recognize that there are other uh, dimensional standards, um, such as setbacks and yard size, that may prevent these parcels from being subdivided by right. However, I am concerned that removing one major barrier um, to buy, buy right subdivision could be an enticement um, uh, for developers to try to take advantage of potential opportunities to build more units on less land. Um, you know, moreover, the economic fallout from the current pandemic, it has been devastating. Many people are in danger of losing their homes because they've lost their jobs and have been unable to keep up with mortgage payments. We could very well see an uptick in share sales in our residential communities in the coming months. Um, and, and, share, and mortgage foreclosure cases, you know, are currently scheduled to uh, begin um, or start back resume in May. Share sales are the major vehicle uh, for developers to purchase uh, properties. Um, in addition to that, Mr. Chairman, the CZR bill also creates an additional residential zoning district, RSA 6, which has a lower minimum lot size requirement, 700 square feet. Properties that are currently out of compliance with the existing RSA 5 minimum lot size requirement could be rezoned to this new classification 
to address this uh, issue. Um, and, and just for uh, the record, the maximum proposed height for RSA 6 is currently 25 feet, as opposed to 38 feet in RSA 5. It is intended for two-story buildings. Um, now, this may not be the best argument, uh, but I, I want to say to you uh, that because RSA 6 um, is intended for different circumstances, but I just wanted to, to note that for you all. Um, increase in permissible units um, in the RM1 zoning district. This is the second issue, Mr. Uh, Chairman. While I understand that the current formula for determining the permissible units, it can be confusing to implement. The proposed change results in significantly more by right units as the lot size increases than the prior uh, formula. And Mr. Chairman, I want to uh, note to you for the record that the testimony that I'm giving to you now, I will submit um, in, you know, in writing so that the committee and the stenographer can have it for the record. Um, while the ninth district has a relatively small number of RM1 zone parcels compared to RSA5 parcels, the potential increase on the existing parcels is concerning in terms of its impact on the quality of life for ninth district residents. More than half of our RM1 parcels would be eligible for an increase in units. The majority of these would only be for one unit, but 11.5% of our RM1 parcels would be eligible for four or more additional units. Um, as I mentioned previously, we have seen developers, and I'm not talking about the good actors here because we've got a lot of good ones, but we've, we've seen some try to squeeze as many units as they can out of a parcel with, with limited room to grow in the ninth district. We want to ensure that increases in dwelling units are done um, uh, responsibly. Um, the third issue, Mr. Chairman, allowing accessory dwelling units, ADUs, in RSA5s and CMX1 zoning districts. As is the case in other districts, the ninth has regular issues with owners of RSA5 properties, listen, illegally converting their basements into apartments. With one third of the ninth district RSA five lots greater than the proposed 1600 square foot minimum uh, lot size for ADUs, I'm concerned that property owners will try to use ADUs as a loophole to add an additional dwelling unit to their home by right instead of having to go through the zoning appeals process to request a multifamily uh, dwelling. Again, the, the RSA 5, it's the densest. It's the single family zoning district. Mr. Chairman, I would argue it is intended for row houses. Um, my office periodically encounters the CMX1 properties where the use of the main floor commercial space like below the dwelling unit um, is now obsolete. Um, for example, the property located in a primarily um, a residential community. Um, this is typically um, because we rarely have business owners living above their businesses, as was often the case, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would argue when you and I grew up. Um, uh, because CMX1 generally only allows for one dwelling unit per property, conversion of the commercial space to an additional dwelling unit requires a variance which provides an opportunity for community input about the change in use at the property. Um, and since ADUs are, you know, by right, if all the conditions are met, there is significantly less opportunity for community input on the change if ADUs are expressly uh, permitted in the uh, CMX um, one dis district. Even though ADUs are subject to deed restrictions, which would be reviewed by LNI prior to a permit for an ADU being issued, um, enforcement would be complaint based or be reviewed um, if the owner applied for a permit to make changes to an existing ADU. Elena simply doesn't have the resources to proactively ensure that ADUs are not, you know, turned into regular dwelling units. And given um, the diverse composition of dwelling units and zoning districts across the city, 
I think we need to have a more in-depth discussion about potential locations for ADUs. Um, particularly, I know in the 9th District, um, our R, um, RSA 5 and CMX 1 lots are simply not appropriate options in the 9th District. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to again say to you and to say to Councilwoman um, Sanchez, um, you know, we've been interacting for uh, some time now. And you know, land use is something that I, along with all the district council members, take extremely um, uh, seriously. Um, and I'm telling you, um, it will be a storm in the 9th Councilmatic District if these changes um, were to be made and they applied um, uh, to us, um, particularly when it comes to changing basements into apartments. I mean, you don't know how many people come and, and they, they make the act, right? And then they'll come back and say, oh, you know, I didn't know. I thought it was zoned. And then we have people on a block full of single family dwellings say, you know, wait a minute, Sherelle Parker, when we purchased this property, that's not what we signed up for. We moved on this block because this was a block full of single family um, dwellings. And, and why should it not um, be allowed to uh, stay that way? So I just wanted to put on the record, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, my concerns, um, you know, on these issues. And as we see neighborhoods changing like lightning, um, you know, before our very um, eyes, I think the character and quality of life of of, of our housing stock um, is extremely important. And um, that is why I have requested that the ninth district uh, be a, be exempt from the three issues that I mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Leader. Before I acknowledge um, Councilman Catherine Gilmer Richardson, I would like to acknowledge Councilman Bobby Heenan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I think uh, Leader Parker uh, said a lot of uh, what I was going to uh, discuss, you know, especially when it comes to quality of life in our neighborhoods and, and zoning a major, major underlying um, uh, issue all right, that affects our, our, our constituents directly. Uh, most people don't pay attention to it. Uh, but I know we as uh, district council members and the rules committee do. Uh, for that, I'm going to echo what uh, council member Parker said and wish to be uh, exempt out of this bill on the three issues that she said. And that was the education uh, of other civic uses, the minimum lot size on RSA 5, and the um, accessory uh, dwelling units. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're, you're welcome. Um, Council Woman Captain Gilmore Richardson. <clears throat> Take it, you have to come off the mute. Of course, that's the line for 2020. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I wanted to thank our Majority Leader, Council Member Parker, um, for uh, that robust uh, zoning uh, education and explanation uh, for the benefit of, of this uh, hearing. Uh, and I uh, wanted to take time out, and although I'm an at-large uh, council member, I did reach out to my district council member, uh, Council Member Jones, who says, amen and ditto, put that on the record. So I wanted to put that on the record. Um, I am concerned about uh, specifically the uh, accessory dwelling units and also the issue around the, the minimum lot sizes, particularly in the fourth council district. And I can speak to, because I've lived here uh, all my life, we are having a major issue in this community um, um, with individuals purchasing uh, larger lots where we have our larger uh, stone homes and they're breaking them down and adding so many units that are not like the character uh, of this community. So wherein you had one particular home on a lot, then now you have, you know, four, five, six properties on one lot that was technically made for one um, home. So we do have concern. I wanted to put that on the record. Uh, I have alerted um, Council Member Sanchez and thank her for the robust work that she has done. Um, but I would ask that we consider uh, an overlay district uh, as is stated um, in the updated version of this bill in chapter 14-500 for the fourth council district as well. And I, I'd like to ask if we um, could, you know, get Council Member Jones on the record around this issue also, that would be helpful. But we have a major issue with that um, here, um, particularly in the Winfield uh, and Overbrook communities in the fourth council district 
And I'm concerned that this will um, really um, lead to a major proliferation of these issues really plaguing our district. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Any other comments and questions from members of the committee? Mr. Chairman, it's Bobby. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, Councilman Heenan had put his hand and then I'd like to speak. Co thank you, Councilman Heenan. Thank you, uh, council member. Uh, and, and first, I do want to recognize, uh, you know, council uh, Marie Quinona Sanders uh, for all the hard work as she was describing at the opening of, of this hearing. Uh, it's that kind of collaborative work that, you know, that the departments working together, uh, ensuring uh, what's going on in our city when it comes to this growth, uh, you know, protection of the quality of life and inclusion in all our neighborhoods. Uh, so, uh, Council Member Sanchez, I want to thank you, and I apologize for uh, being a little bit late to the game here on on this. Uh, but I erred in the three exemptions uh, that I spoke about earlier. I mentioned the education and other civic uses, which is incorrect. Uh, I will put them in the chat, uh, but it would be the minimum lot size RSA five. It would be. Uh, B40 uh, accessory dwelling units and the B2 simplification of unit calculations in RM1 and CMX2. Uh, thank you for your time. And again, uh, Council Member Sanchez, I appreciate it. And in, I'm not sure about the working groups you had mentioned. I would love to see, as Chair of L and I, and on the um, uh, the over L and I Oversight Committee. I would, I would love to see the recommendations from the uh, the COVID working group, the developers working group, BIA planning uh, groups, recommendations, uh, you know, as your, uh, you know, very, very in-depth process uh, took place last year. So uh, thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, Councilman Heenan. Any other questions or comments? Councilwoman Maria Kelly Sanchez. Any other questions, comments, from members of the committee? Okay, hearing none, would a clerk please call the next bill? Um, Councilman Johnson, did you want planning yes. commission's testimony? Yes, absolutely. We, I mean, we I don't have to, to, but I think you no. need it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think we, we actually have a, did we? Okay, 210078. Brett, that has been called up, correct? Correct. Yes, we just need to hear. Um, that, that's what we were hearing on. Paula, you can now present your testimony. Thank you. I just thought Michael Decker was going to come and yell at or yeah, scold yeah, us for not doing yeah. this. So. You're good. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the Rules Committee. I'm Paula Brumblow Burns again with the City Planning, um, City Planning Commission. I'm here to testify on Bill Number Two One Zero Zero Seven Eight, which was introduced into City Council on February Second, Twenty Twenty, by Council Member Keona Sanchez. Bill number 210078 amends Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled oh, Zoning yeah. Planning by revising and clarifying certain provisions and making technical changes. Proposed bill creates substantive changes to the zoning code that are aimed to create a healthy restart of community driven and equitable development. This bill proposes significant changes toward modernizing the code. The creation of an RSA 6 residential single attached dwelling district will recognize the unique character of small street row homes and support existing two-story residential blocks by allowing smaller homes on existing smaller lots with a height limit of 25 feet. This change only creates the district. Each council person will be able to decide where it is appropriate in their own council district and would have to update the zoning maps through legislation. Second, the creation of SPCIV, Special Purpose Civic, will create a specialized zoning district for schools, hospitals and other civic, ex use, ex civic uses that are tailored to their unique needs within their dis districts. Again, this will just create the district itself. It will need a separate council action to be mapped. The RSA 5 single attached districts minimum lot size will be reduced to reflect on the ground realities by decreasing the minimum lot size from 1,440 square feet to 960 square feet which will put 70% of ex existing lots in the district into compliance. 
the number of units based on lot size calculations have shown to be a challenge to understand for the average code user. So the bill proposes to update RM1 residential multifamily lot calculation to 360 square feet of lot size per unit and CMX2 commercial mixed use to 480 square feet of lot size per unit. In an attempt to create more affordable housing options within the city and to encourage aging in place for our senior population, the bill proposes to permit accessory dwelling units in RSA 5 and CMX 1 commercial mixed use districts on lots that are greater than 1600 square feet. Accessory dwelling units have been included in the code since 2012, but have only been recently permitted within historic districts and properties. This change will permit them on large residential lots within one zoning district. The bill updates the review process for civic design review for warehouse uses and specific and specifies that if they abut residential districts, they will be referred to the committee for review. Additionally, the bill provides a clear review of properties that are split zoned and will allow applicants and LNI to know which zoning districts apply to the properties. Also including our clarifications on specific definition, definitions, use requirements, setbacks and parking requirements. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill Number 210078 at its meeting of February 25th, 2020, and I recommended approval as presented. I will like to add to my testimony that this bill has seen several amendments. One addresses heritage trees in industrial districts. One amendment gives a different, a better clarification on split zone districts. There have been some RSA 6 discussions for amendments and having listened to Councilperson Heenan and Parker and Gilmore Richardson for Jones, we understand that there will be additional amendments to this bill if it moves forward. I am happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments from members of the committee? Yes, Councilmember Johnson. I'm sorry, I got like logged off for technical uh, technical issues. Uh, I want to thank and I want to recognize again Councilmember um, Parker as well as Heenan, and we will we are as the hearing proceeds reaching out to Councilmember Jones for clarity around this stuff. This is they're right. They're, this is not a one size fits all. Uh, this is an issue around districts with large um, vacant land, like uh, is the case for uh, uh, the third, you know, the the second, um, the fifth, and the seventh councilmatic district, and which is why we have from day one been willing to work with district council members around areas that they feel uncomfortable in as they work on their remapping. So I, my team will reach out to council member Heenan um, and is reaching out to council member Jones if they want to join council member Parker and O'Neill in exempting themselves from certain provisions to allow them in their remapping process to utilize the tools where they um, deem appropriate. So uh, as the hearing proceeds, we will let you know, council member, uh, chair, madam, uh, chairman, uh, so that we can proceed. Thank you very much. And I, again, I want to thank the, the planning commission and all members uh, for their input. I agree. You know, we can't use blunt instruments in neighborhoods. We have to be intentional and focused and deliberate. And some of these toolboxes are meant for people to, to, to opt in as opposed to out, opting out. In this particular case, folks want to opt in out so that they can choose how to opt in and we will respect um, that council um, decision in their planning process. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Right, you're welcome. Uh, um, any other questions or comments? Mr. Member of the committee. Thank you very much. Would a clerk please call the next bill? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I did have my hand raised. This is Council. Oh, oh I'm Bass. sorry. I, I, That's I okay. Apologize. No problem. Councilman no problem. Cindy Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to uh, just weigh in here. I did speak, uh, for the record, I did speak with uh, the councilwoman prior to the hearing and asked for further clarification of the impact uh, of this legislation on the 8th District. And I know that, um, as she had mentioned to me when we spoke earlier, and as she just mentioned now, um, the 8th District doesn't necessarily fit into the mold of the um, uh, of the targets uh, that uh, this bill is trying to address. And so uh, while we haven't made a, a decision yet in terms of whether uh, to remove the 8th district uh, from being considered uh, with the impact of this bill, it is something under consideration. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll begin uh, doing additional research and having further conversation 
to uh, figure out whether this is a fit uh, and how it will impact the 8th District. Because, again, it's not something that um, what the 8th District was not uh, in mind when this bill was uh, conceived. So we'll have further conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you're welcome. Councilman Bobby Heenan. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have a uh, question for, for Paula. Paula, thank you for your presentations today. Uh, extremely well prepared, and we appreciate all your hard work. I, I have a question on the civic design review for mixed use <coughs> districts and warehouses. Um, can you explain, if, if you would, to me a little bit? I have, uh, and, and I guess, you know, the city at large. Um, basically, I mean, we have some issues and I would love to speak with uh, more depth with uh, Council Member uh, Canona Sanchez and Planning Commission uh, and, and, and some other Council Members. We should be discussing the warehouse distribution in uh, as logistical hubs here in the city of Philadelphia, uh, which includes transportation, uh, access to our public rights of ways and, and, and streets. <clears throat> because, um, you know, any piece of, and which I support, by the way, uh, you know, 1,000%, especially in my role as a co-chair of a manufacturing and industry task force, uh, which uh, employ local people, sustainable wages, uh, and, you know, putting back on our property uh, roles of uh, employment and, and uh, revenue for our city. Uh, to help fund our schools and, and, and so forth. Uh, but these, I'm going to call logistical hubs and warehouse distributions, uh, are very, the stock went up on them, all right? That's the new future of, of manufacturing and employing Philadelphia's, uh, you know, starting at like 150 uh, people, you know, at the low end and, you know, well, well past and exceeding three, 300, 350, and they're local people, you know, near transportation. Uh, the uh, any piece of industrial land, uh, which includes abandoned buildings, uh, which includes delinquent buildings that are zoned industrial, are uh, in very much need for this new future of logistics, getting product to people quickly, uh, as we saw through COVID. And you know we have a you know we've learned a lot over the past year, but this. But this has been planned long before COVID, uh, and it just became more valuable uh, since COVID. So what is the, and I have large logistical hubs and warehouse distributions in my district. Uh, so what is, what is the idea behind, um, you know, by, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe it as by right, uh, by not having civic design review. Uh, for for these warehouse distributions, or am I just not? Am, am, am I wrong in implying that that's what they're for? Um, you, you're you're correct on the logistical hubs, and one of those things is we saw logistical hubs coming before COVID, but we didn't necessarily address it in the code. We didn't address them yet in this code rewrite. It is something the planning commission is keeping an eye on and would love to work with your office to develop something better if you would like. But what it is, is because they're not manufacturing and they're more of a warehouse, there have been some cases where it's been, does it go to CDR? Does it not? What, and CDR is reviewing the public realm. They're not reviewing the use. They're not reviewing variances. It's just the public realm. So we kind of wanted to make a little bit more of a firm structure around it. And so what we wrote was, and I'm reading, I'm reading the code section, so if I get it wrong, please correct me, that if they are in I-1, 2, 3, or P, IP, that the wholesale distribution and storage use category does not, and it does not affect a property in a residential district, it does not have to go to CDR, and I'm waiting for somebody to tell me if I'm wrong, but if it is a budding residential or impacts residential, it does need to go to civic design review because when a resident is looking out their window and they're seeing this, that is part of the public realm. So it's to make sure that the public realm gets addressed if it's impacted by residential or it impacts residential. And, and, I, and 
you know, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, we want the community to be involved, involved uh, you know, for sure. Um, you know, I also, you know, kind of, you know, agree with by right, you know, when there's where there's no residential, is it defined somewhere on the uh, proximity of uh, abutting and neighboring uh, or adjacent properties? Like uh, it, you know. it is in 14-304. Okay. So in the administration of the zoning code, which is uh, 14300, it does kind of give a map on what is an affected property and what is not. Okay. So I mean, it's listed specifically. It, and I want to say Mason Austin, who wrote the text for both of these bills, has not corrected me, so I believe my answer stands. It, I think it's a great answer. I just don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what, what, what feet, like, uh, you know, proximity, it would be, it would, you would be a street and 80, you know, complete streets, like 80, maybe, yeah. you know, let's just say 80 feet. So yeah. it would be within, you know, 100, 100, 150 feet, 200 I'm feet. I'm trying to find it on the fact sheet. So just let me, not I'm having all of my papers printed out in front of me, I'm a little bit slower than I used to be. It's a budding, a residential zoning district. Okay. A that's, budding. So there is a clear, it has to share the property line. Adjacent perfect. would be across the street. It does not apply. Thank you very much. Thank you for your Thank answer. you for being patient with my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Sir Chairman, that's all I have. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions from members of the committee? Hearing none, would a clerk please call the next bill? For bill number 210081, we have Sarah Adama. Couldn't, would a clerk please call the first step? Witness? Sarah Adama. Sarah, are you there? Yes, I'm here. You can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay. Please proceed Great. with your testimony. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairperson Johnson and members of the Committee on Rules. My name is Sarah Adamo and I am the Legislative Affairs Manager for the Department of Licenses and Inspections. Today, I am here to provide testimony on Bill number 210081, which was introduced by Council Member Squilla. If enacted, the bill will amend Chapter 9-3900 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Property Licenses and Owner Accountability, Section A-906 entitled Property License Fees, Chapter 14-604 entitled Accessory Uses and Structures, and Chapter 19-2400 entitled Hotel Room Rental Tax to add and revise provisions related to the use of properties for limited lodging and hotel purposes and to collect and to the collection of hotel rental taxes. I am also joined by Paula Brumelow Burns of the City Planning Commission and Rebecca Lopez Chris of the Department of Revenue. Currently the zoning code allows two different types of limited lodging. Short-term limited lodging which provides accommodation for up to 90 days per year and limited lodging homes which provide accommodation for 91 to 180 days per year. In each case, the maximum duration of any one visitor's stay is limited to 30 consecutive days. The zoning code further specifies that a permit is not required for short-term limited lodging, but a permit is required for limited lodging homes. Additionally, these uses are required to be accessory to a dwelling unit which means that short-term rental of a property is not intended to be the primary use of the unit. The enforcement of the current provisions has proven to be difficult because violations leave little to no observable evidence. Inspections cannot determine whether, um, inspectors cannot determine whether a property has been rented for more than 90 days in a year or how often the owner resides there. Moreover, inspectors' attempts to gain access to the property are usually thwarted because no one is present when the inspector arrives or because the occupant declines to allow the inspector inside. This bill proposes to make a number of changes to the existing regulatory scheme. 
It creates two new licenses, one for the operator and one for the booking agent. The conditions of the licenses will help to help the city more effectively enforce the requirements for limited lodging and ensure that only appropriately licensed properties are able to offer limited lodging. A few, a few key components of the license include, one, any person operating a unit it, um, as limited lodging must obtain a limited lodging operator license. Any person or entity facilitating reservations or collecting payment for accommodations on behalf of a person must obtain a limited lodging or hotels booking agent license. Two, a primary resident of a dwelling unit must be identified on the limited lodging license application. A primary resident is defined as a natural person not a corporation or business who either owns the unit or is the resident or is a resident tenant for more than half of the year. Limit three, limited lodging can only be offered for rent um, by a licensed limited lodging hotel booking agent. Four, the limited lodging operator license must be displayed in the rental advertisement. Five, the licensed limited lodging and hotel booking agent is only permitted to offer for rent units that have valid limited lodging operator licenses or a rental license that identifies the occupancy as a hotel. Six, the limited lodging and hotels booking agent is required to disclose the details of all reservations that they have booked within the city. This allows us to not only confirm that all units are property, properly licensed, but also that the city is receiving appropriate tax revenue. The bill also proposes to remove the current limitation on the number of days that an operator can rent per year, provided that no visitor stays longer than 30 days. The bill, this bill will help to ensure that these uses are either limited to owner occupied units or that they are appropriately zoned as hotels. The intention is to use to limit new I'm sorry. The intention is to limit nuisance impacts in residential areas and reduce the potential for limited lodging to displace residential units in the overall housing market. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered bill number 210081 at its meeting of February 18th, 2020 and recommended approval. The administrative, the administration is supportive of this bill and the Department of Licenses and Inspections is prepared to enforce should it become law. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the department's testimony. We are happy to answer questions at this time. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Or any other, let me acknowledge Councilman Mark Squiller, who's the author of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for the great explanation. Uh, I just want to, uh, for the record, now uh, state uh, we've been having still a lot of questions from the community on the bill and, and how it could be maybe massaged a little better or tweaked. Um, we are considering amendments on this bill. Um, we are here in testimony today. I have agreed to, to hold the bill to meet again with the communities, groups who are in support of this bill, but think that we should maybe do a little more work on it. Um, just for a couple questions for Sarah, um, the licensing for each individual property owner, the, could you just say the fee for the booking agent and the fee for the, um, license permit for the uh, property owner? Sure. Um, so if you are a limited lodging operator, meaning you are the, um, the primary resident of a dwelling and you would like to offer it up for um, limited lodging rental, it is um, a license fee of $150 per year. If you're the limited lodging um, booking agent, meaning you're the uh, company that offers these properties, um, advertises them, offers them up for rent on uh, online and collects the payment. The um, license fee is initially $7,000 and then the renewal is 5,000 and that's an annual renewal. And how about a fee for if you do not live in, in the property and it's a, um, to get a license for that? 
Um, so if you, if there is no primary uh, resident in the property, then um, you would need to um, obtain zoning, a zoning permit for uh, what the zoning code calls visitor accommodation, which, you know, is a hotel. Um, and then you would need to obtain a rental license and a rental license is $56 per, per, uh, per unit with a maximum fee of $22,770. Okay, just for clarity, so that people understand. So if you if you live in the home and you were do, you're renting it, you paid a $150 fee. If you do not live in the home and you are the, the property owner, you then have to go through the zoning process in order to do that. So a single family home that nobody lives in, they would have to go through a zoning process in order to get approved. And uh, at that point, they would pay the fee for the license. Is that correct? That is correct. I just want to clarify that they would have to go through the zoning process, meaning, you know, obtain a variance um, only if they're in a district where the use is not permitted. So if you're in a commercial district where hotels are permitted, you may be able to obtain a buy right permit. If you're in um, these, you know, more residential row home districts, um, you would require a zoning variance and you that that would trigger the um, RCO meeting, the appeal to the zoning board, all of that if you're in an area where hotels are not permitted by right. Okay, because what you're going to hear some questions are from some folks that um, have concerns uh, with the bill, and we will again continue to cut these conversations with the community groups. Is that there are some places that are um, CMX three zoned in in some of our outskirting neighborhoods, uh, close to say uh, Center City, where you could do this by right. So to do it by right, you would have to then pay a license for each unit, um, but they would not have input on on the actual uh, rezoning process. So their concern is how do we then make sure that they're good operators? And that's something we have to to uh, look into. The other question is, uh, as a booking agent, do we believe the way our language is written that they can hear from somebody testifying today, that our booking agent will be held by every booking agent. And they all will be treated exactly the same. And that, um, if there is no booking agent associated with this, then they will not be able to legally rent that property. That's correct. So um, all booking agents are required to obtain this license um, and a booking agent can only advertise for sale and collect payments for licensed operators and licensed operators are only permitted to rent through licensed booking agents. So. There's a condition on both of their licenses that ties them together. Okay. All right. Thank you for answering those questions. You're going to hear a couple more questions and not sure if you could um, be available uh, to answer uh, some of the more technical questions as we go through this. And like I stated, um, we will be holding the bill and, and looking to adjust certain things as, as we move forward. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Mr. Chair. Councilwoman McCaffrey Gilmore Richardson. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to uh, thank my colleague, Councilmember Swilla, for his work on this issue and for working with the community organizations. I know that I have received a lot of outreach uh, on this bill uh, in particular, and I want to thank him for his commitment to continuing to work through uh, some of the things that uh, were brought up within the community meetings. Um, I wanted to put a few things on the record around this bill specifically, um, because I think, you know, as a sort of description, a summary description, we're using the terminology Airbnb, um, but specifically in Winfield, and I've uh, talked to Council Member Squilla about this, we have other platforms that are offering rooms uh, for rent uh, under the visitor accommodation model. Um, so, you know, it's not an Airbnb, it's not on a booking platform like an Expedia um, or some other type of site, um, but it's specifically for houses um, in this community, and I think one other community in Philly, uh, I believe is Fishtown uh, is the other one that they're advertising in, but a majority of the properties are here 
in Winfield. So I, I just wanted to know how you're kind of working through those challenges to ensure that we're, you know, dealing with all of the various platforms uh, that we've seen. Um, so, I mean, of course, Airbnb is the biggest. That's the one that, you know, everybody thinks of. But um, the way the, the bill is written, um, the definition of booking agent is uh, all encompassing. So any any um, platform that has that similar model would be required to obtain the license. Um, the only exception is that if the um, the website or the uh, you know entity that's offering for rent is offering something that's under the same trademark. So, for example, Marriott.com offering res uh, reservations for Marriott. They're not required to obtain the license. But any other platform that's doing this type of um, of offering for rent, uh, whether it's a room or an entire, um, you know, building uh, a home, all of those would be required to obtain the same booking agent license. Okay, and one other thing I wanted to put on the record, Sarah, uh, is around the fines, but also around student housing. Um, I don't know if you um, remember, and, and I don't recall how long ago this was, but the fourth was exempted out of the uh, educational, we had the educational housing district provision um, around more than a certain number of unrelated uh, citizens residing in one property. But at any rate, um, you know, from what we can see, there's an issue with renting out rooms in very large homes. Um, for instance, a house that may have, you know, eight different uh, large bedrooms being rented out to kind of circumvent uh, the student housing process versus a short term or long term visitor accommodations. Um, is that something that you all are, um, you know, really taking into consideration as you further deliberate this bill, meaning, um, you know, individuals trying to circumvent the ed educational housing district um, overlay? Um, it's something that's definitely a concern of ours. It's a concern all over the city and, and it's definitely a concern of LNI's for, um, for a number of reasons. One of which is, um, you know, fire code related issues. The more people you have in a house, the more fire code issues are, are going to arise. Um, so that's definitely something that is always on our radar. Um, this bill, um, I'm not sure how closely that ties to this bill specifically because um, w this would pretty easily allow us to know how many rooms were being rented because there is a condition of this bill that um, the booking agent gives us that information. So if it's being, if it's properly licensed, if it's being rented through a licensed booking agent, um, part of the condition of their license is that they are regularly providing us with that information. We would know how many rooms are rented, uh, how many nights per year they're rented and how much uh, that rent costs for each rental. Um, but, um, you know, renting to, to multiple unrelated people is something that is constantly on our radar and we're always, always concerned about it, always following up 311 requests whenever we get them about that. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And last thing, you know what I wanted to mention about the fine structure. Do you think that the fine structure will be adequate enough for you all to uh, be able to, to do and have better enforcement? Or should it be increased? Because I know I've heard of other um, cities, uh, particularly those that have a lot of uh, tourist issues like Miami Beach and others um, that increase their fine structure um, so that they have a better opportunity to enforce from the perspective of your department. Right, so the um, the violation fine that is built into this legislation is a class two violation, which is a thousand dollars per day. Um, each day is considered to be a separate offense. Um, so that does add up very quickly. Um, and we have class one, two, and three. So this one's pretty much the one in the middle. Um, and um, I think, I think the great thing about this bill is the way that the licenses are tied together. It really um, hopefully alleviates a lot of these violations being issued. Um, you know, the one, the one license can't work without the other. Uh, so, you know, hopefully we, we eliminate the need to, to issue a lot of these violations. But I think 
it's a good starting point. We can always revisit it later if we think that a higher uh, fine is is going to help us enforce. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Sarah. Thank you. You, you're welcome. Any questions or comments from members of the committee? Yes. One last um, question. So, Councilman Squillip and Councilman Brian O'Neill. Yes. Yeah. All right. One last question um, from me. Just on the um, some of the concerns was that L and I would have to do a lot of work on the enforcement here, and that and maybe this is a, a question for law. But the question was, can those fines be? pump back into L and I to have in the enforcement dollars go to make sure we could uh, manage this type of uh, enforcement moving forward. And uh, what it was always told is the the fine dollars and the money has to go directly to the general fund. Can you, can you speak to uh, You broke up a little bit at the end, but I think I got the majority of that question. Um, so as you know, the, the uh, fines and the license fees, they all do go to the general fund, unfortunately. Um, you know, they, they can't come directly back to l and I. But um, another advantage of the <laughs> structure of this legislation is that um, it will really affect how we, um, how we go about enforcing this bill. So under the current code, if we get a complaint, um, you know, there's a service level agreement. We, within a certain number of days, visit the property, knock on the door, see what we can find. If nobody opens, you know, we take a look around and see if we can determine that it's being used as limited lodging. Um, it's very hard to, to issue a violation based off of that type of inspection. But this legislation allows us to, uh, to do a lot of that enforcement, um, you know, from the office. We're going to get um, reports from the booking agent that says we rented X, Y, and Z properties for um, you know this many days. This is how much we collected in uh, rent for those properties. And then we can simply compare that to the licenses in our system. So we'll be a lot more efficient in the way that we can enforce this because of because of the fact that it will be done primarily from the office. Is that it, Councilman Squiller? Thank you. Yes, you that's all. Hopefully that'll answer a lot of the questions of the people who are gonna be testifying. And I know Councilman O'Neill, I think, had a question. Councilman O'Neill and Councilwoman Cindy Bass. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is actually uh, regarding uh, the split um, district, multiple district uh, aspects of bill number 210078. And um, it, I'll direct it both to Paula and Sarah. Um, I want to make sure that there's nothing in the amendments that would allow the following. Um, I had a long uh, litigation involving a zoning case that there was a misinterpretation, but the judge in common police court, you know the case. I know the um, case. And um, the um, if that interpretation had been allowed, mm -hmm. a shopping center that backs up to homes that are residential could have taken one of those homes or an empty lot zone residential behind them that had street frontage on the residential street, not the streets that the shopping center fronts on. And incorporated that into their deed, made it one property. And then they would be able to say, you know, 98% of the, of the, of the parcel is commercial. And um, uh, we want a driveway out to that other street um, for easier access for people to get in and out. And um, they would have been allowed it. They would have been permitted under the interpretation that was involved in this litigation. Um, fortunately, we won that one, but the um, I just want to make sure there's nothing in here that would allow someone to do that, that owned the commercial property. 
our goal was to prevent that. And I believe we might have gotten it, but would you like us to sit down with your office and go over all of the scenarios to make sure we get it right? Yes. And okay. While you we're want me to reach out to Bobby? I'm consulting uh, through my staff um, uh, with uh, a former uh, uh, executive director of the Planning Commission uh, who okay, was a chief I witness know. that helped us win that case. Um, okay. So, Would you like yeah, me to reach out to Bobby? Concern about that. I what I'm reading all sounds good. I just don't. You know, this is subject to interpretation in the end, and I want to make it clear that you can't make sure it's clear that you can't do that. It is, and sometimes it's the more we talk about it, the more we can kind of tweak to get it correct. So okay. I will reach out to Bobby tomorrow. Okay. Sure. Uh, okay. Alice. Alice. On Alice. Alice? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll reach out to Alice tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Councilwoman Cindy Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, weigh in. And actually, I just, you know, really had more of a general comment on enforcement from LNI because uh, it's, it's a problem. It's been a problem. It continues to be a problem. And so I'm very hesitant to um, believe that we can get new things right when we can't get right the things that are on the books right now. And as an example, I'll mention uh, there's a block in my district in Germantown. Uh, we recently contacted LNI um, about the um, development of uh, some rooming houses and some other things that were uh, inappropriate for that particular area. Um, and we were basically giving no assistance from LNI and have been working on it through our office to try to find alternative ways to address these issues for the people who live in the community and who are really, um, to some degree, held hostage. So. I, you know, I, I, I hear that, um, you know, you're going to try to get it right. You're, you hope to get it right. You, you think you got it right. Um, but in our experience, in terms of the performance of enforcement specifically, uh, we just have so many issues that we can't get the level of enforcement that we need. Um, and we can't get enforcement that matches what the problem is. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail because, um, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, give away personal details that could uh, basically, um, you know, inform people as to what situation I'm specifically talking about. But, uh, you know, I, I just really wanted to be on the record as I hear Ellen and I speak about, um, you know, they, they think they got some stuff right. You know, that's just not enough of a confidence builder for me based on the track record uh, that's uh, that's uh, at hand. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to state that for the record. Thank you very much. Any other questions and comments regarding this particular bill? Okay, hearing none. Well, first of all, sir, I just want to thank you. Um, I think Councilman Mark Squilla would like if you could sit around uh, while sure. we go through public comment for just maybe adding some additional clarity um, as he moved forward, um, even though he's going to hold the bill, but the additional clarity will help as he crafts out um, the finalization of this bill um, based upon input from his constituents. Uh, with that being said, uh, we are going to um, take a brief moment um, to allow members of the public who have registered for public comment on this particular uh, on these particular bills to join us for this virtual meeting.
Mr. Chair, we are now live. At this time, we will now ask for individuals who have signed up for public comment. The clerk will call your name and you will unmute yourself using star six. Once called, please state your name for the record and we will proceed at, with your testimony. For the clerk, please call the first witness. Andy Feinstein. We were not able to reach her. Robert Germigan. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Robert, you may state your name and again with your testimony. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear okay. you, Robert. Please proceed with your testimony. Oh. Okay, I, I was not able to view the testimony prior, so if I repeat something that's been said before, please excuse me. Uh, my name is Robert Germankin. I'm president of Franklin Bridge North Neighbors. We're the RCO for the northern part of Oak City. Um, I won't go into any details about the issues we've had in our neighborhood from short-term rentals, uh, but suffice to say that the police at the 6th District, as well as Councilman Squiller, are well aware of the problems we've had. Um, while this bill doesn't do everything we had hoped for, we strongly support this legislation. Uh, we do hope that between now and when it comes to vote before the full city council or some future legislation, that certain things can get added to this bill. Uh, one of the big concerns we have is with enforcement. It seems that sometimes bills pass city council put new responsibilities on different agencies such as LNI. But with these new responsibilities, Often there's not the additional funding needed so that they can properly enforce these new regulations. So we would like to ask that a percentage of the license fees from the limited lodging licenses, the new rental licenses, and the booking agent licenses be used to fund enforcement by LNI. Perhaps they can use funds to create a dedicated position or positions similar to LNI's nuisance property unit. That way there can be some accountability and neighbors, owners, booking agents will have a dedicated person they can turn to. Um, also, in addition, for the units classified as visitor accommodations, we'd like to see some way for authorities to be able to contact management or the owner of these properties 24-7 in case of emergency or behavior that's severely disruptive to the neighborhood. Uh, this kind of mechanism already exists for regular visitor accommodations as hotels will have on-site staff. You know, many of these properties are essentially staffless hotels. Um, these properties also differ from regular apartments, long-term rentals, and that the occupants that cause the issues often are long gone before the management or owners are even aware that there's a problem. So, so th that's all I have to say, and I thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Will the clerk please call the next witness? Todd Schwartz. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Todd, you can state your name and proceed with your testimony. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Johnson, Councilman Squilla, and the rest of the esteemed committee. My name is Todd Schwartz, and I'm chair of the Zoning and Planning Committee of the Lower Monumenting Civic Association, LOMO, and we reside in South Philadelphia. Thank you again for allowing me to address this important bill, 210081, whereas the problem of short-term rentals, absent of the owner occupying the dwellings, prevent residential neighborhoods, such as ours, from being vibrant stable, and livable. We have experience where homes that are being used for short-term rentals, absent the owner, compromise the comfort and safety as well as increase the increase in noise, litter, and the general well-being of our community. It has become so bad that several of us had to resort to calling 911 as a result of the poor behavior of the residents 
of the non-owner occupied short-term dwellings. While in Grateful, that council recognizes that non-owner occupied short-term rentals be addressed, I am concerned that this bill does not specifically address and prevent any of the aforementioned issues, quality of life issues. To me, to be more precise, this bill does not necessarily acknowledge that there is a problem in the first place, which indeed there is. In closing, I would respectfully request, and I believe Councilman Squilla, you have already addressed this and thank you very much, that you please hold the bill in committee as additional members of the community would like to assist in improving this bill. A bill would, which would preserve and improve our residential neighborhoods. With that, thank you very much for your indulgence and thank you for your service, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Michelle Olski. Hello. Can Michelle, you cut out. Uh, Michelle Olski, are you there? Hi. Can I? Um, Hi, can everyone here? Now we can hear you. Uh, you may state your name and proceed. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Michelle Oleski, and I'm a member of the Lomo Civic Association and a member of the Lomo Zoning Committee. Um, I first want to thank Councilman School's office for hearing our concerns regarding Airbnbs and the likes prior to presenting this bill. Um, due to my involvement in the Lomo Civic Association, I've had multiple neighbors reach out to me regarding concerns and issues they have with the Airbnbs. I'm going to uh, read off a brief list of some of the comments I heard. Obviously, these comments are summarized, but it'll just give you um, an idea of some of the issues that we're experiencing and possibly how this bill may not address them. Um, just to start off, I've heard, I'm scared and I don't know what's going on next door or who to contact. There are people coming and going throughout the night. I'm afraid to let my dog outside because of the noise. There are people gathering and lined up to enter. I hear yelling and noise from the house next door and can't sleep. I'm concerned the people staying next door may be involved with rioting. I believe they are selling drugs out of the home. I called the police, but no one came. My neighbor moved out years ago and I have no way to contact him or her about their Airbnb. I called 311 many times, but this has been going on for a long time. Um, obviously, these comments, they're really hard for us to hear um, as an RCO, and because what we're trying to do is we're pr trying to promote a sense of community, and these kinds of dwellings aren't really helping with that. Um, I just feel that I want the community to be comfortable reaching out to us um, as an RCO and for us to be able to provide them with some guidance. But for the most part, all we are telling these people and all we can do is to call 311. Uh, my recommendation regarding this bill would be to keep it in committee so that we can further develop it to include regulation and oversight of these short-term rentals. Uh, similar to a liquor license, I hope the bill can include guidelines for revoking short-term rental licenses for disturbing the peace and other safety concerns. Uh, I feel like having these guidelines in place and these rules are going to promote more responsible management of the short-term rentals, even though what I believe is that they're going to be best managed with the owner present in the home. Um, what's something I hear a lot is that there's a lot of owners that live out of state. And I just feel like with, you know, the owner living out of state, it's almost impossible for them to appropriately manage these properties. The other comment I wanted to make as everyone discussed, you know, the different fees um, was about the booking agent fee of $7,000. Now, that figure seems like a large figure, the $7,000, but our RCO has encountered... Um, a company, an individual actually, an individual and his wife that um, acts as a booking agent or what this bill would consider a booking agent. And they actually currently have 
180 listings on Airbnb. So if you take that $7,000 uh, figure and you divide it by 180 units uh, advertised on Airbnb, that comes out to less than $40 per unit. Uh, so in some ways, it seems like a substantial figure, but on the other hand, it doesn't so much considering how many units and how many listings uh, are out there. And for the most part, that sums up everything I have to say today about the bill. So I thank everyone for their time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Samuel Reed. Samuel Reed. Stephen Huntington. Stephen Huntington. Eric Pufaf Moody. Eric Pufaf Moody. Okay. Jennifer Jordan. Jennifer Jordan. Uh, Brett, I'm um, sorry for the interruption. Um, could you give us a, a brief moment? I think the uh, connection is broken. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for calling Philadelphia City Council. A beeping noise will indicate when you are on the show with the host. In the meantime, enjoy this music. Hello, are we back? Yes, Lonnie, we're back. Okay, great. And so, and so and so, Lonnie, what we're going to do, do you have a, the individuals who are listed to testify that you can confirm that they're on the call or not? Or should Brett just go back through our list again since they, we had a bad connection? Uh, we have uh, Cindy Feinstein is back. She was the first person. And you can, the, the next person after that would be, um, I believe, Samuel Reed. And then you can continue thank, down the list. Thank you very much. Brett, can you can you go ahead and call the next witness, please? Cindy Feinstein. My name is Cindy. Hi, my name is Cindy Feinstein, and I'm testifying in support of Councilperson Squilla's proposed legislation on short-term rentals, Bill Number 210081. I live on the 400 block of South Carlisle Street a short connector between Pine and Lombard Streets, which is a half a block west of Broad. I'm a member of the Center City Residents Association. Our block on South Carlisle Street is comprised of 15 19th century townhouses owned and operated by professional people, some families with young children and a few retirees. We're a compatible group of city residents and we hold an annual block party. In 2018, the home two doors from mine was sold and the new owner converted a four bedroom home into an Airbnb sleeping 16 plus people. This individual has many properties he operates as Airbnbs across Philadelphia while he resides in Hoboken, New Jersey. My neighbors and I have had countless problems with the stream of people staying at the Airbnb on our street in the last two and a half years. We've registered many complaints with 311 and with Airbnb through their website. 
There have been numerous times the Philadelphia Police Department was called for late night disruptive behavior, vandalism, and domestic disturbances. In May, LNI issued a temporary cease operations order for violation of Philadelphia COVID restrictions on large group gatherings. According to Police District 9 records, from the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020 to the present, there were 23 911 calls to 413 South Carlisle Street. The most serious occurrence in January 2021 resulted in an arrest for a domestic disturbance involving a handgun. Despite all our efforts, this owner will not comply with either city ordinances or Airbnb stated policies. I am all in favor of strengthening city ordinances governing short-term rentals. As tax-paying city residents who maintain the 19th century homes that give Philadelphia such character, my neighbors and I watch as strangers invade our block, diminish our quality of life, and violate current city ordinances with impunity. For that reason, I am strongly in favor of Bill 210081 proposed by Councilperson Squilla. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard today. Thank you very much for your testimony. The clerk, please call the next witness. Samuel Reed. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Sam. Please present your okay, testimony. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and council members. Um, my name is Samuel Reed and I'm a Philadelphia public school educator and uh, I also side hustle for social good the rest of the time. Um, I've been an Airbnb host for almost three years, and I became a host to pay for the hospitality that I've received during all of my travels, both domestically and internationally. I rely on the income that I earn from Airbnb to maintain my old house here in Overbrook and to generate supplemental income to support causes that my wife and I believe in. As you may be aware, short-term rentals are an important part of the Philadelphia economy, providing much-needed hospitality and visitors for visitors in large, large events. I serve as an Airbnb host advisory board member, and I also moderate a local uh, Philadelphia Facebook group of over 200 hosts. Many of our short-term hosts in our group earn important extra income to help make ends meet, keep up with basic expenses, or support for savings for school and retirement and other essentials. As the city council deliberates over the rules and regulations for the property license and ownership accountability policy, I would encourage you to consider the following. Uh, one, I think council should keep the cost low and the registration process simple, especially for primary listings like myself. Um, there also should be a, a reasonable window to roll out any new regulations uh, the public should have an opportunity to provide additional time for comments to weigh in any drafts or changes to the ordinance. And lastly, and maybe even most importantly, like the short-term rental hosts, our personal information should be secured and protected at all costs. As a short-term host and as an engaged citizen, we want what's best for our city and for ourselves. So we're available as, as an Airbnb host. I'm available for you to reach back out to me if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Stephen. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. Great. This is Steve Huntington. I'm testifying as the chair of the Crosstown Coalition. I want to thank uh, Council Member Squilla for reaching out to us and asking us for comments. Um, we put together a sort of rush rush meeting, a Zoom on Friday night. There were uh, folks attending from 15 RCOs. I sent each uh, member of the committee uh, a memo summarizing the points that uh, we reached a consensus on. Um, we thought it would be helpful if we could get a few pieces of homework. Uh, we'd like to discuss the bill with uh, one of the people who put it together, and I guess Sarah would be the logical person to reach out to. So we'll do that uh, as soon as we can after this session. 
um, Councilman Squilla provided this very interesting information as to what was done in other cities and other countries. It looks like he has a source that it would be useful for us to see, and I distribute that to the 34 RCOs in the, in the Crosstown Coalition, if we could have that presented. And it would be useful to be able to review any statistics that the city may have as to the number and location of current Airbnb operations. I think that would just be a useful starting point. Um, in terms of the problems that we were speaking about presented by Airbnbs, uh, noise, especially in the wee hours of the morning, uh, property maintenance issues, uh, trash, no removal, and just the general problems presented by absentee owners, which uh, I, I guess Cindy Feinstein uh, presented in detail a couple of minutes ago. One of the requests that we'd have uh, is that the identity of Airbnb operators and brokers should be easily available to the public so that if neighbors have concerns, they can reach out quickly to the operators who are responsible for the concerns. The second issue uh, I think Bob Germankin brought up uh, is we'd like to have some sort of 24-7 contact resource so that if there's noise or the gun issue that Cindy Feinstein mentioned in her testimony at 2 or 3 in the morning, we have somebody to reach out to. Uh, the broker might be a, a logical uh, point of contact. Another issue that the bill presents is, I believe, and Sarah might correct me, but I think the bill just requires that the broker's license number be listed. Um, that requires uh, somebody who has concerns to go behind the license number, figure out the name of the broker with the license number. It would make sense just to have the broker's name listed. Um, people have already spoken about the issues of enforcement. Uh, we have concerns that the LNI is not properly funded for enforcement and would suggest that some of these funds, not some of these license fees, not go into the general fund, but be uh, designated directly to LNI. Um, one issue that you might want to think about is calling upon LNI to issue at least one report, maybe two years after the legislation is enacted, to see what changes, improvements uh, have been made and could be made. Uh, another concern that we had, and this may be because we didn't properly understand the bill, we didn't see uh, that there was a hammer for infractions. Uh, it was our suggestion that um, some consideration should be devoted to uh, maybe a three strikes and you're out approach with the idea that <clears throat> operators should be concerned if their conduct does not meet standards, they should be concerned with losing their operation license. And uh, finally, and maybe this is within the bill now, but we would like the legislation to provide that at least in a property which is zoned R for residential, that uh, there could be no Airbnb operation unless the primary owner, the deed owner resided in the property. So uh, those are our thoughts. Um, uh, I'm going to try and contact uh, Councilman Squilla 
and set up some dialogues so that uh, we can work through these various considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Will the clerk please call the next witness? Eric Saf Moody. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my wife and I own the Cornerstone Bed and Breakfast. It has been a uh, fully zoned uh, six-bedroom owner-occupied bed and breakfast for 22 years, and we are Philadelphia's only select registry distinguished in of North America. Uh, we're one of 20 fully licensed B&Bs uh, in Philadelphia. Many are women, minority, and LGBTQ owned. And uh, to be entirely honest, uh, we're all terrified because the poor enforcement of non-owner-occupied Airbnbs is, is killing us after a year of absolute struggle. We've been through hell and back. And now, just south of us, there are four dozen new Airbnbs that are not owner-occupied on Lancaster Avenue, two blocks from us you know, serving the exact same community. And after all the hotels in our area, as well as us, have been down 80% in revenue, they're opening up eight to 10 units. Um, I'm also a, a board member of the Powelton Village Civic Association, just to talk that we are in no way associated with Airbnb. Airbnb hijacked our name uh, because of our quality, and they do not represent our quality. And we are wondering how all these units sidestepped the neighborhood oversight and how are they i mean every single business every single coffee shop every single thing that needs to come through comes through the our civic associations and why are they immune from it we're terrified every house that's listing that it's going to be another rental unit it's it is a problem now and i, I agree with previous comments it needs to be called on as a problem and my suggestion in both support of the bills it needs to go much further you know uh, we, uh, what, you can't make one group like us follow the rules. We are owner-occupied. We take care of our things. You can always uh, access us. At one point, to move from six, five rooms to six rooms, we had to spend $15,000 in legal fees. Why do, do the mom and pop like us have to follow the rules? And a multi-billion dollar company is, can get around them. We have thousands of new hotel rooms being added in 2021 paired with this unregulated short-term rental we need to put a cap on this my three requests are we limit how many variances uh and how many they can be given where because part of what we work for in the Powelton village civic association is to build community and we're being robbed of it there are shootings we have transient populations were being our housing prices are being artificially inflated and then like i can echo so many others before me ease of enforcement how can we report offending properties quickly to make sure that i mean i i'll be honest with you the attitude now is do it and ask for forgiveness later i mean there there's flag, flagrant violation and we support we support in uh, owner-occupied rooms as short-term rentals, but the non-owner-occupied units need to stop. We highly support evening the playing field. But being a fully licensed BMB, we have yearly uh, fire marshal checks. We have smoke alarms. We have fire alarms. We have fire extinguishers. We have insurance. We pay additional hotel tax. We're a small business. We're a mom and pop. We are part of our community. And these people near us have dozens and dozens of units that they opened up without any regulation and without any consideration to what they do to the neighborhood. And they're not even in state. And the final thing, 90% of what we spend our money on is local. We support local business. We partner with local business, women, minority-owned businesses. When money is spent here, it is staying in our community. But when it's being sent to Airbnb, this is not, I'm sorry to, to the previous speaker, it's out of control. It's being used as a, as a loophole and people are coming from everywhere and taking 
Philadelphia's capital away from us. And I, I think it needs to be taken into committee and made much, the enforcement needs to be made much stronger. This needs to come to an end. This is a problem and we must address it. Thank you so much for letting me speak today. Thank you. Will the clerk please call the next witness? Jennifer Jordan. Hello. This is yes, Jennifer. You're, you're on, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I own a uh, short term rental management company called Slate and Hearth. Um, the, 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 Excuse me. The pandemic has exacerbated many issues in the city, um, and negligent short-term rental operators is one of these issues. As an Airbnb host since 2013, I have seen many bad app operators come and go. In fact, many of the owners reach out to me for help in turning their rentals around. I fully support regulations and parameters in which to operate in. My company has held itself to the highest standards. Property shortage, excuse me, proper storage, disposal of trash, maintaining litter, snow and ice free sidewalks, screening guests and making sure they are aware of house rules, which include no smoking in and around the home, 10 p.m. quiet hours, respecting neighbors, etc. We advise guests to park in garages and lots to keep streets open for residents. We keep our homes in compliance with city permits up to date with smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, and we keep our home occupancies low. That means no 16 people get um, homes. We have very um, limited number of guests we, we house to avoid parties and disruption. We advise guests um, to please respect the neighbors. I do kindly request for the sake of the city that tour the tourism industry be considered. With Philadelphia's heritage city status and cultural draws, um, the need for accommodations is great. The bounce back of pocket neighborhoods depends on these small weekend travelers. Businesses in which we partner with find foot traffic essential, especially during these times. While I understand and agree that bad operators need to be removed, folks and companies doing the right thing should not be punished because of these negligent operators. Um, thank you for the time to speak today and um, thank you for your consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> Jacqueline Wiggins. Yes, I'm on. You can hear me? Yes, okay. we can hear you and you may begin your testimony. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone and members of the Committee on Rules. My name is Jacqueline Wiggins, and I'm a long-term North Central resident, having moved as a child over 60 years ago to the street I currently reside. I'm also a committee person of the 32nd Ward 11th Division. I am extremely concerned about the enforcement capability of Ordinance 210081 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Property Licenses and Owner Accountability. I live in North Central, as I just mentioned, where across the street is an Airbnb, or if that's not the term, what seems to be different people arriving on weekends and leaving on Sundays or Mondays at times with what can only be considered great frequency. Having such properties become licensed is one thing, but whose responsibility, aside from neighbors who must endure loud parties, excessive trash, and that means trash going into other people's yards, damage to others' property, people not wearing masks, and as happened on December 18th, 2019, a shooting that sprayed this particular residence on Page Street in North Central with 23 bullets on a street with residents. And many of these were families with children in the early morning hours where a lodger, someone who was there, was also shot. The police, when I have asked a few times, have yet to find the shooter or shooters. When I went to Council President Clark's 5th District office, a constituent services staffer directed me to L&I after providing some information about the property. 
I was in contact with former Commissioner David Perry and former Managing Director Brian Abernathy about short-term rentals, with both stating that these rentals are problematic but need input from a wide range of stakeholders, especially residents. I've also been in contact about this situation with current LNI Commissioner Ralph DePietro. However, with respect to that property on my street, within a few months of that incident of that shooting, this property was back in business and continues as such until, I guess, this coming Friday. Will it will continue. How will this ordinance become enforceable? Now, I have heard some things in listening today, but I, as C- Councilwoman Cindy Bass mentioned in terms of the confidence level, I don't quite have that. I would like to support this, but the licensing is one thing. Where people in, were people impacted by negative behaviors of the renters of these properties part of the decision making with respect to Bill 210081? In closing, this ordinance concerning limited lodging, where owners must have a license, is one thing, as I said before. But when limited lodgers fail to be respectful of the people and the property and the quality of life of others, whose responsibility will this eventually become? Calling 311, calling the police is, is a temporary fix. And I think enough has been said from previous uh, presenters with respect to that. And I would like to be included, along with some others here in North Central, with respect to future meetings discussing this. And thank you, Councilman Squilla, for taking this on. Uh, Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, Kelly Faye? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You may begin. Great. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, members of the Rules Committee. My name is Kelly Fay, and I'm a policy associate with Airbnb's public policy team. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to provide feedback today on Ordinance 210081 uh, to regulate short-term rentals. I'd also like to commend the City Council for their ongoing work throughout the pandemic to protect your city. As we know, the last year has presented significant challenges for governments and those they represent, and we applaud your leadership. Uh, We believe short-term rentals can be a significant part of the economic recovery solution for the city by allowing its residents to generate supplemental income while supporting a strong return of tourism to Philadelphia. In order to ensure that recovery, we encourage the city council to develop a streamlined online process for registering short-term rentals to encourage strong compliance and enable its residents to leverage home sharing at a time they need it most. Many of our hosts in the city turned to home sharing initially during the Great Recession to earn additional income while they were unemployed. This financial stability has continued to be helpful during the pandemic. Roughly 55% of new Airbnb hosts in Philadelphia during 2020 were women. As you know, in 2015, the city council was a global leader in establishing short-term rental rules. And that same year, Airbnb began collecting and remitting the city's hotel room rental tax. In 2019, these taxes generated $5.9 million for the city. Since 2015, both the short-term rental industry and Airbnb have involved. Uh, the commitment to our, the safety of our guests, hosts, and local communities has remained consistent. We launched a 24-7 neighborhood support hotline for neighbors to communicate directly with Airbnb. Last year, we put a global ban on party houses with manual reviews of high-risk reservations. In addition to that, we placed restrictions on allowing guests under the age of 25 without a history of positive reviews to book an entire home in their area. And we've also introduced a number of systems and policies aimed at deterring unauthorized parties. In 2019, we also announced the launch of an online park portal for law enforcement to provide a secure and streamlined way for them to submit valid legal requests for information. Through the portal, law enforcement is able to securely track those requests. Philadelphia PD has been an active users of our law enforcement portal, and we've been able to support their investigations. Um, In June 2020, we launched our enhanced cleaning protocol. The standards are informed by guidance issued by the CDC and advice from Dr. Vivek Murthy, the former and current Surgeon General nominee. So as the city seeks to recover from the pandemic and update local rules for hosting, we ask that you consider our suggested changes regarding the booking age and definition, customer data privacy, and providing host time to cure before they are removed from platforms. We believe they address our concerns and will ensure strong compliance. 
and we remain eager to work with council member Squilla on fair regulations and a simple registration system that will allow Philadelphia to continue to reap the benefit, um, the economic benefits of home sharing. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, Vice Chair Squilla, and all the rules committee members for your time and consideration today. Thank you. Would a clerk please call the next witness? William Dugan. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, my name is Will Dungan and I live in Fishtown. I'm testifying on item uh, 2178. Um, really quick though, before um, I testify in support of reducing the minimum lot size requirement, um, I did want to quickly talk about the proposed change to the mixed income housing bonus that was mentioned by the chairman, but if that's not germane, let me know and uh, I'll skip ahead. Um, just on, on that proposed change, um, the way I see it, the best way to support affordability in a city is giving people the tools to stay in their homes. And according to the 2018-19 Housing Trust Fund report, there are over 10,000 home improvements and 4,500 stabilization services that were funded. So things like uh, improving HVAC, uh, you know, putting heat in homes, um, putting air conditioners, that kind of things. Um, in addition to 300 rental units and 80 home purchases. And the Housing Trust Fund provided money for those purposes. So if we replaced the funding mechanism with the on-site requirement, we'd reduce or eliminate that funding source uh, in addition to less housing getting built overall. So I, I'd really, really be concerned about making that change. But um, moving on to, uh, to today's agenda, um, I, I'm testifying in support of reducing the minimum lot size for the RSA 5 zoning district to 960 square feet. And I support this change for three reasons. First is affordability. So in this town, uh, pretty much all the new construction homes uh, are unaffordable. Uh, you know, they're, they're large homes, uh, they're, they're essentially mansions and the minimum lot size effectively mandates these mansion size homes. Um, giving the option to build homes on smaller lots will create a really good middle ground, I think, between apartments uh, and these mansions. And that's kind of what we need in, in my neighborhood. Second, I think it's gonna reduce the burden on registered community organizations. Uh, legalizing more types of housing means there will be fewer requests for variances and, and those requests for variances put a lot of demands on time for, for volunteers and that's not really fair to them. Uh, and the third reason I support this is that it, it really matches the existing homes in the neighborhood. Most homes in Fishtown uh, are not on lots, uh, you know, that, that would um, meet the 1440 minimum square feet size requirement. So reducing the minimum lot size would encourage more homes to be built that are similar in scale to the older houses. So really would improve the aesthetic of the neighborhood. Um, so I, in conclusion, I support this change. It, it will enhance affordability. It's gonna reduce the burden on RCOs and it, it'll encourage new homes to be more similar in scale to existing homes. Uh, you know, other cities, large and small, uh, all across the country are taking steps to make their cities more affordable. Uh, reducing minimum lot sizes and maintaining the funding sources for the housing trust fund are critical to making Philadelphia a place that more people can call home and everyone who calls it home currently, you know, can afford to stay in their house. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Would a clerk please call the next, next witness? Benjamin Shi. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, you may proceed. Okay, yes. Hello, my name is Ben Shi. I'm a renter and I would like to fully support Councilwoman Sanchez's bill uh, 210078 as drafted without the district carve-out overlay. I am strongly against the councilmanic prerogative shown here today to exclude districts from the low-income reform through the overlay. It's appalling and distressing every time it's proposed. As Councilmember Pino Sanchez stated, the bill has already gone through rounds of professional review both with planning and city council. It ensures the continuation of responsible by-right development has not gained the variances and politically influenced trips to the ZBA. By right development must be upheld as a central tenant for the zoning code. The point of zoning reform is to gauge land use changes across the entire city and to adapt for the best fit. We have to do the hard work of finding the true public opinion about zoning changes from all voters, including renters, and then making compromises with all council members to hammer out the solution, not with these carve outs. We have one zoning code in the city of Philadelphia, not 10. If this attitude was displayed during the 2012 zoning code overhaul, it would never have gone to pass. Next, I would uh, just like to agree uh, with the carve out of the mixed uh, income zoning bonus. I agree with the previous comment about the necessity of the housing trust fund today. 
Philadelphia is now dependent on it as a reliable source to make these crucial home repairs. And by eliminating it as an option uh, for developers in a very high, in a very active second district, uh, you would severely see that uh, revenue stream just drop. And it just votes, you know, very, uh, votes very badly for that. Um, in term, in, in respect to the RSA 5 lot size issue, I support the revision to decrease the minimum lot size from 1440 to 960, as well as with RM1. Um, throughout the development boom, we've seen single family row homes grow ever larger into huge mansion sized houses. But historically, working class neighborhoods in north, south, northwest, northeast Philadelphia have all built up working men's home row house blocks that are far smaller than 1440 square feet. Um, these, these are all a thousand feet and lower. So developers do need more options to utilize smaller vacant lots and also to subdivide, sub, subdivide larger parcels so that they can build smaller homes. These smaller homes will be much more affordable to working class folks so that they have a chance as well to become future homeowners. Um, I'd also uh, like to uh, put my support into ADUs that do not want to see any sort of um, carve out, district carve out. ADUs are the best way to support multi generational living in the aging neighborhood. The ninth district, in particular, is an aging middle class homeware area that would be well suited for ADUs as generations of families grow. And, and the older generations actually do want to stay with the family. The best way to ensure familial and social stability in single family row house districts is with ADUs. And also, if there are, if there are accounts of lots of homeowners who want to subdivide their house for an ADU, that's an indication that these homeowners need to be acknowledged and represented and not reflexively opposed every time. For climate change, ADUs and minimum lot service form is crucial to combat and address climate change, uh, to allow the loving to live more efficient, sustainable lives, and to accommodate future climate refugees and immigrants from vulnerable regions. In conclusion, we need to lay all the facts on the table. Um, I invite council to read AARP Pennsylvania and the state's recent 2020 Livable Communities Action Plan, which is, which is available on Phila.gov website, which specifically calls for accessible dwelling units, ADUs, and states the clear reasons why they would be well, why, why they should be welcomed in the city. I hope that council council project can be defeated and this bill can go forward as proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we have the clerk call the next witness? <clears throat> Carl Gershenson. Oh, hi, my name is Dr. Carl Gershenson. I am testifying as a, uh, a citizen of the second district, um, but my views are informed by my work as a researcher specializing in housing instability. As we all know, you know, the country is in the midst of a housing crisis that's been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so my testimony today is uh, coming from my concern for ensuring that all Philadelphians uh, can af afford stable housing. Um, so I want to s emphasize my support and enthusiasm for uh, bills 2175 and 2178 as drafted, including the revision of RSA 5 and RM1 lot sizes, uh, and also the sections of the bill that would lower parking minimums. Um, on, on a pedestrian safety note, I would like to urge council to strengthen restrictions uh, in the vehicle repair and maintenance provision in 2175 by restricting these facilities in CMX 3 as well as CMX 4 and 5. Uh, car repair and sales are a common and frequent nuisance in residential neighborhoods all over the city. Uh, and, I, you know, they're more industrial than commercial in many senses. Uh, they often block sidewalks. And as a parent pushing a stroller, I have often been forced to walk in the street. Um, of course, this is also a danger for citizens using wheelchairs. Uh, really, there's no way to solve this problem without taking curb parking uh, outside facility boundaries. So I, I think that these facilities are mostly inappropriate uses in all zones except for I-1, 2, and 3. But my major reason for wanting to testify today involves the amendment to Bill 2175 that would remove in lieu payment options for the mixed income housing bonus in RM1 units in the 19146 zip code. Uh, you know, I, I am a resident of, of the second district and I share Council Member Johnson's concerns about affordability in this district. But it's, I, I think that this amendment would be a move in the wrong direction. Uh, for example, I know that there's a leader of a prominent preservation advocacy group who has been advocating for removal of the in-lieu payment option, specifically because he believed 
that if affordable units were required on site, then quote, even one affordable unit would make these small condo projects unviable. So this amendment in practice would mean that 19146 would no longer be contributing as much as it could be to the affordable housing stock, either via on-site construction or via in-lieu payments. Uh, and as uh, one of the previous uh, speakers, I think Will Dugan testified, uh, you know, th the, the housing trust fund is essential to keeping residents in their homes. Um, my other concern is that removing in-lieu payment options for RM1 will make affordable missing middle housing options, such as multiplexes and small walk-up apartments, much more difficult for developers. Uh, if we look at the building in Southwest Center City that led to much of this current discussion, uh, an unremarkable $750,000 row home was demolished and replaced by five units that are each priced at less than half of the original row home. So the neighborhood gained five lower price units and 45,000 was contributed to the housing fund. I think that's an example of the density bonus working to facilitate affordability in this district. Uh, because I do share Council Member Johnson's concern about affordability in the second district, I would not object if in-lieu payments raised from 19146 were specifically directed to affordable units constructed in 19146. But as currently written, I am concerned that this amendment will result in a reduction in funding for affordable housing and result in fewer missing middle housing units being built in our community. So for these reasons, I urge the council to reject this amendment to bill 2175. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. With a quick call on the next witness. Marcus Ferreria. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we Hello, can Marcus. you hear me? Okay, great. Yes, Hello, my name Marcus. is Marcus. Great. Uh, my name is Marcus Ferreira. I'm the chair of the South Street West Business Association, and I also serve on the South of South Neighborhood um, Zoning Committee, and I chair the, uh, the policy arm of that committee. Uh, the reason why I'm calling today is uh, a laser focus on uh, the aspect of Bill 2178. Uh, two uh, with respect to uh, simplification of unit calculations in RM1 and then also CMX2. Uh, we uh, is at, on South Street West support this bill, but we're hoping that it can go further as to the unit calculations on CMX2. Um, what, what this bill does is it says, hey, for, for RM1, you start out with a, a unit calculation of, uh, of 360 uh, for the first 1440 uh, of lot size. And then after that, it bumps up uh, to, I believe, 480. In CMX2, it starts at 480, and then it bumps up uh, at 1440 lot size to a number in the 600s. And what we want to do is just make it equal for both. And the reason for that is because when the, when the code was being revised in... 2011-12 and for the 2035 plan the assumption was was hey in rm1 in general you're getting three stories of residential so let's base the unit um the, at 38 feet let's base the unit calculations on that in cmx2 you're also getting uh 38 feet and it will be two over one two residential floors over one commercial and so they they adjusted the calculations so that you couldn't cram in a bunch of units on the on the two, but de facto in CMX two, uh, we found over the past eight years and even before that, before the, we got the extra three feet in, in the code adjustment of height from thirty five to thirty eight, was that no one was able to build CMX two uh, without some sort of string of variances, usually two out of three with respect to lot coverage, height, and or density bonuses. And then what you would end up have, having is nearby residents complaining that, hey, this greedy developer who's building this corner commercial uh, mixed use parcel or this parcel on South Street uh, needs all these variances uh, to move forward. And what we found is in general, you needed a, a third story of, of height uh, of residential above so three over one 
to make it four stories at like 41 or 42 feet. And I'll give you examples. Um, so in the past 10 or so years, uh, the, the first example is going to be an outlier. It's the Royal Theater, 1522 to 1536 South Street. That was just rezoned to CMX3, and there's well-documented reasons for that. But um, then you go to 1542 South Street. That had to be built at, at four stories. Uh, 1600 to 1602 South Street, which is currently Tio Flores, double wide, four stories. Founding Fathers, triple wide, uh, four stories. Uh, 1619 to 21 South Street, they cram four stories into 38, and then you have a really squat commercial uh, frontage, which is currently a, uh, a, a drugstore. Um, you know, if if we had uh, allowed additional height there, it could have gone, um, it, it, the, 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 the ground floor would have been nicer. Uh, 1701 to 1709 South Street until recently was a 7-Eleven. Uh, that was all four stories. Uh, 2133 to 43 South Street, uh, currently a Wawa. Five stories they made use of the three street bonus. And then also the, the infamous uh, 2300 South, which never got built. And now it uh, remains a parking lot for an Amazon uh, distribution center. Um, the, the point here is that Yes, this is great that for larger lots, which are 1440 and greater, where maybe in on South Street, it would have to be a double or triple wide to, to reach it because we have narrower uh, lot that's where it's drained by Rodman on the north and Cater on the south. Um, but almost de facto, you have to go three residential over the one. So... What we're asking for is the same 360 um, for the first 1440 uh, as a, as an amendment to this um, proposal. So we we just want it to be the same standard as RM1. And as we go through the process of remapping, we want to be able to go to property owners who might be inclined, you know, to, to think, oh wow, it would be neat to restore a former corner commercial to um, to its glory, um, where currently I've been renting out that first floor, but it's just easier for me to stay RM1. So no, thank you. I'm not going to remap this corner or the central uh, portion on South Street from RM1 to CMX2 because I can do whatever, I, I can operate profitably in RM1, but I can't in CMX2 the way it's written. This is not going to fix all the glitches, but it, it would move Currently, as written, it, it moves it slightly uh, for the double and triple wides. Uh, it doesn't really affect our single wides. And so my ask is for the to help the much more common single wide situation to reduce it to uh, the same standard as RM1 uh, throughout. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the next witness? Councilman, or Mr. Chairman, there are no other witnesses. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone else here for public comment that would like to speak on any of these bills? Okay, hearing none. Council support, I would like to take a 10 minute recess. Councilmember Johnson, I just want to say one thing before you go and I want to thank everybody who testified uh, on bill on the, the, the short term rental bill and um, appreciate their efforts and looking forward to continue working with them uh, to finalize um, the draft of this bill and hopefully be heard at next hearing of the rules committee on April 19th. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Council and Mark Squiller. Council support, can I get a 10 minute break? Uh, yes, you can, Mr. Chair, I'll notify right. channel 64. So we would like to take a 10 minute recess.
Mr. Chair, we are now live. Thank you very much. Um, this concludes the hearing. We will now go into a public meeting. Are all of my colleagues available? I'm here, Council Member Johnson. Squilla. Ryan O'Neill here. Catherine Gilmore Richardson here. Fiona Sanchez here. David O is here. Hi, this is Councilwoman Cindy Vance here. So we will now reconvene to a public meeting and for the official record, uh, we will call roll. Will the, please, will the clerk please call roll and take attendance? Members are in attendance. Will please indicate as you just did and say present when your names are called. Mark Squilla. Present. David O. Still present. Bass. <laughs> I am present. Catherine Gilmore Richardson. I'm present. Maria Canona Sanchez. Presente. And Brian O'Neill. Present. Thank you, everyone. Um, the chair recognizes the council, Mark Squeller, for a motion on bill number 200628. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 200628 be reported from the committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Can I have a second? Second. Second. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200628 be reported from this committee with the favorable recommendation of further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it and the motion passed. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squilla for a motion on the amendment to bill number 210075. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer amendment to bill number 210075. The copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to bill number 210075 be approved. Second. Second. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 210075 be approved by all those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. And the amendment to bill number 210075 have been approved. Chair, uh, chair, chair, chairman, uh, this is... Uh, uh, Councilman Bobby Heaney, I'm sorry I got disconnected. I just wanted to be recorded for roll call for the purpose of uh, voting in the public meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilman Heaney. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on bill number 210075 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the bill number 210075 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and the further move the rules of council be suspended to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. Second. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 210075 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation. I further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it and the motion passes. The chair recognizes Mark Squiller for a motion on the amendment to bill number 210078. Uh, Mark, before you move forward, um, Councilwoman Marie Keona Sanchez, district, do you want to speak on the bill? Yeah, real quickly, I wanted to have um, the planning commission. I want to thank all of my colleagues who district council persons and others who've worked through, to, to, towards this bill. 
Um, as I stated earlier, um, this is not an either or, this is an and and an and, and I totally respect uh, council district members who are working at preservation strategies that might be uh, very different from redevelopment strategies from other things. So I uh, want to give everyone the space to opt into options in their district as they remap in their uh, own planning processes with their community members and so forth. So I want to thank the planning commission. We took everybody's feedback input um, and the amendments that Paula will explain reflect everyone's input. This, these are never final decisions. So I continue to encourage my district council people to look at this. And if there's some additional um, changes or modifications that we have to make, we will honor them as we have always um, in this process. This is complicated. This is remapping. This doesn't happen overnight. It, it's always fluid. I want to personally thank the Planning Commission, LNI, and others, uh, the BIA, and other members who participated in many conversations as we got here. So thank you, Paula. Can Paula, can you address? some of the uh, accommodations and recommendations and feedback that we got from district council members that are reflected in these amendments. Yes, so we quickly drafted something and I want to make sure that when we read it, if there's a, if we didn't get it right, please let us know. So for an a bill, amendment to bill number 210078, we want to update the exemptions that were requested at the hearing today by clarifying that the 4th, 6th, 9th, and 10th districts will maintain the existing standards today for the RSA-5 lot size of 1,440 square feet. Accessory dwelling units will not be um, included in RSA-5 and that the RM1 unit calculations will not increase in their districts. Then while the 6th and 10th district shall further maintain existing standards for CMX2 unit calculations and it will prohibit all accessory dwelling units. Additionally, the amendment updates the term roof access structure to roof deck access structure and makes changes related to grammar, syntax, and numbering. Thank you very much, Paula. You're welcome. The chair recognizes the council Mark Schooler for a motion on the amendment to bill number 210078. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I offer that the amendment to bill number 210078, a copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to bill number 210078 be approved. Second. Second. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 210078 be approved. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it and the motion passes. The chair recognizes the council Mark Schooler for a motion on bill number 210078 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the bill number 210078 as amended be approved, uh, reported out from this committee with a favorable recommendation to further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 210078 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it and the motion passes. We will be holding bill number 210081. Um, before we conclude, let the, let, the, let the record reflect that this bill will be being held at the request of the sponsor, Councilman Mark Squiller. Um, this concludes the meeting. I want to thank everyone um, for their participation in this hearing. If there are no additional remarks, uh, this concludes our Rules Committee hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great job. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And You're thank welcome. you, Council Members Squilla and Quinona Sanchez. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Good job, everyone.